we are going to close out this series uh, called Crisis Brings Renewal because everything we keep hearing these days says that this election is a crisis in our our nation's history and it's a it's a hinge point where where everything's going to either get better and better and better and we'll all be in blissful um mm. heaven or things are going to go to hell in a hand ask it and it's one or the other and depending on who you're talking to depends on who they think is going to win the presidency Maybe. Uh, so uh and, and i've said it before and i'm going to say it again there's simply no call for that because salvation doesn't arrive on air force one and, and neither does an apocalypse and, and so i mean i don't remember elections in the past where i just went to bed with this uh feeling in my stomach like oh my word this is gonna be bad for years and you know what i survived them i um, don't <laughs> I did not die. Um, but uh, we just get it into our heads uh, that the end is coming, or, or that, that this is the relief we need. And just simply put, I mean, it's one person with a political office. And They've got to try to work through everyone else who's in political office. And they've got bureaucrats they've got to deal with who have minds of their own. And um, in the end, it just, it doesn't, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't make a difference, because obviously it does. It doesn't make that big of a difference. And the reason I don't think it makes that big of a difference is that because we have a government that is, quote unquote, of the people, by the people, and for the people. So guess what makes the biggest difference? People. <laughs> they are forgiven. That's why I think the leaders have to be able to lead. Yes. And not just listen to, like you said, bureaucrats. I'm not even sure what that word means, but as long as they can lead because they're representing us. <coughs> yeah. And that's an easy thing to forget. Uh, I've heard that, um, I don't know if it's right or not, uh, but I've heard that congressmen are probably the, the people who, and women, people who are not in the Senate, they're in the House of Representatives. I've heard that they are the only people who are genuinely um, trying to um, serve the people, shall we say, because they have to be elected every other year. So they're pretty much constantly in campaign mode knowing that what they say and what they do is going to have an effect on them at most 23 months from now you know um so it, it, that's what it, they need germ loans what's that well they need germ loans when somebody gets a billion dollars <laughs> to run for an office that only pays more of a million i mean yeah there, there's there's some questionable things but in, in a way that that kind of rolls into because um what i really wanted to focus in on is, is this idea uh, of what jesus told us um back uh in his ministry is that the kingdom of god is at hand now when jesus was brought before pontius pilate basically he was questioned about this basically hey do you think you're a king that, that you're gonna like raise some rebellion and, and, and he's like no no you got it all wrong it's my kingdom is not of this world it is but it's also at hand and so there's there's this logical contradiction that the kingdom isn't yet that someday he's going to come down and he's going to make everything on earth right and, and it will be the kingdom truly on earth um, at that point and, and I'm not trying to argue about that or anything, but he still says that the kingdom mm -hmm. is here today. It was it was here when when he was here. We got to see him in action. And we got to see his disciples scrambling as hard as they could spiritually to keep up with Jesus. And there's just no way they could do it. Yeah, it just it, it was a constant game of catch up. Um, and, and so they they did their best. But they got to be there for three and a half years where maybe it was just somebody getting healed who 
couldn't walk and they got to see the joy on that person's face. Or maybe it was feeding 5,000 people from one kid's lunch. <laughs> uh, whatever it was, we got, they got to see three and a half years of the kingdom of God here on earth. And the kingdom of God is simply put, it, it's wherever Jesus is king. When his will gets done, that's the kingdom. So it kind of comes back there. It totally reminds me of, of uh, in Sermon on the Mount when, when um, Jesus is telling us, and I believe it's Matthew chapter 6, um, how to pray. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. <laughs> That's the difference. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm here to say that, that President Trump or President Harris could never achieve, no matter how hard they worked with Congress. Even if every single member of the House of Representatives, every single member of the Senate, all the judiciary, all the bureaucratic people who were hired to fill roles, every Every cabinet member, I mean, if the entire U.S. government worked like only people who are high on drugs think it could, <laughs> even if it did, they still couldn't accomplish Jesus. the kingdom of God. They can't. They can only bring the kingdom of God in the rule and ranking of their life, their, their little section of, of existence. Mm -hmm. And that's what you and I can do. And that's where... In some ways, the church is more powerful than any president could ever be. Because just think about what's been done in the 2,000 years. I mean, yes, the United States is a force to be reckoned with for now. But 200 years ago, there was a saying, the sun will never set on the British Empire. That's right. The sun has set on the British Empire. And you know what? The sun's going to set on America, too. Mm -hmm. He has promised his kingdom is forever. He never promised that America is forever. Mm -hmm. And if you read the book of Revelations, you're pretty hard-pressed to find America in mm -hmm. any sort of a role. Yeah. Sorry, so either, either we're not going to be a, existing as a nation at all, or we're going to be so pulled out of the world theater that we're not going to be trying to control events like what we do today. One, something's going to change. It's, it's inevitable. And maybe that's going to happen in this next four years. Maybe that's going to happen four centuries from now. I don't know. But either way, we can work with the kingdom of God here in our lives. And for us, in this little chunk of land we call Comanche County. And we can see the kingdom of God all day, every day. And what's better is that we can show other people what it's like. Because there's going to be some people, I promise you, who are not going to be interested in Jesus or, or obeying his commands until they see it in action. That's right. When they see it in action, suddenly it makes sense. It's like, you know, Ross's life is running a little more smoothly than mine is. What's he got going for him that I know? Well, he keeps talking about this Jesus that, that's the sort of thing I hope people see. And I hope that when they see that my life does go a little more smoothly, and even when something happens in my life that things get derailed to whatever extent they do, because life happens, right? I still hope that they see me talking about <laughs> Jesus and me saying, okay, this is hard, this sucks, but God is still in control, and I will still praise him. Because he's still meeting my needs. He's still with me through it all. And so... We want to see that the kingdom of God comes here on earth. And I wanted to kind of go to a section of scripture that talks about this. It's, it's, I'm not going on deep to dive on it because it's a whole chapter. But I wanted to show this place that gives us a picture of what it's like. And this is a psalm that King Solomon wrote. Okay? So if you remember King Solomon, David is the guy who wrote like half the book of Psalms. Well, at least half the book of Psalms. And um, his son, after he passed away, it, the kingship passed to Solomon. And if you remember, God came to him in a dream. And he asked Solomon, basically said, because of your father David, I'm going to show you favor. I'm basically, I'm giving you one wish. What do you wish for? He said, 
Yeah, he said, I want wisdom to rule your people well. And God said, that's amazing. That's a great request. And because you didn't ask for money or fame or whatever, I'm going to give it to you anyway. And, and even though Solomon had great wisdom in, in ruling the nation, he didn't have incredible wisdom in ruling his life, much less his actions. <laughs> Man has over 700 wives and 300 concubines, roughly a thousand women in his life. By the end of his life, and I just I, I can't fathom. I can't. <laughs> But did it shame is for sure. Uh, it helped. It didn't help him one bit. It didn't help him at all. No. But at any rate, that man who had God given wisdom uh, on how to rule God's people, his nation of Israel, that we call Israel, he wrote this one. So in Psalm 72, we're going to take a look at what the kingdom of God looks like. So here we go. Psalm 72. It says, Give your love of justice to the king of God and righteousness to the king's son. Now, uh, sorry, I, I just got to say, it. he starts off and he's like, oh, he's talking about himself. But you're going to see pretty quickly he's not talking about himself. It says, Help him judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. Does that happen in the U.S.? Not very well. Uh, may the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be fruitful. Help him to defend the poor, to rescue the children of the needy, and crush their oppressors. May they fear you as long as the sun shines, as long as the moon remains in the sky, yes, forever. May the king's rule be refreshing like spring rains on a freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish during his reign. May he may there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. May he reign from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The eastern kings of Sheba and Siva will bring him gifts. All kings will bow before him, and all nations will serve him. He will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one in the family. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious to him. Long live the king. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May the people always pray for him and bless him all day long. May there be abundant rain throughout the land, flourishing even on the hilltops. May the fruit trees flourish like the trees of Lebanon. And may the trees, or sorry, may the people thrive like grass in the field. May the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all the nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Like I said, you read that and it's like, it's really easy to see Solomon saying, I really want this to be the kingdom of Israel. I want this to be. But he's also talking beyond the nation of Israel. And you look at the very end of it. And it says, may the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all the nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. <laughs> Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Solomon recognized that what he's talking about here is beyond his capability, even with God given wisdom. He couldn't accomplish it. But this is what we call a vision for the future. This is what he wanted to see. And this is what the kingdom of God looks like, where, where the needy are taken care of, where if anyone is oppressed, then People stand up for them, and they knock down the oppressors. Where there's prosperity, I mean, they talked about how the mountains were prosper, prosperous. There's not a lot of wealth that comes off of the mountain. Pretty much we got trees, 
and snow on the top of mountains. But you know what? Two years ago, I went to Vietnam and I got to see something that was, to me, it was amazing. It, it was showed the work of, of literally hundreds of generations where they carve out these terraces in the mountains mm -hmm. and, and they have brought farming mountains. We don't do that. Of course, we have Nebraska and Iowa and, you know, Great Plains. Uh, we have Texas and other places that have great farming. And why would we do that with mountains? Yeah. That's all they have. That's all they have. They've made it work. They've made a living from it. Mm -hmm. Family farm passed down to family, passed down to another generation, to another generation. And they each work to make it better. So the next generation lives life a little bit better. And this is the idea of the kingdom of God. What we're working for is not just to make our own life better. It's to make lives better of those who come out of us. It's a beautiful thing. And that's what the kingdom of God is supposed to be about. And this is what we have a responsibility. And what's more, we have the ability to bring about. And so we have something Solomon didn't. And yes, Solomon had God's wisdom when it came to ruling people. And what he didn't have is the Holy Spirit. He didn't have divine power at his fingertips. God's still doing work miraculous work through his church. And there, there's what I call mundane miracles. It, it, it's the kind of thing that, you know, if the church pulls it off, the world scratches and says, wow, how'd they manage that? They're not like amazed, amazed, but they're like, I don't know how they managed it. But God does that sort of thing all the time. It's such a beautiful thing to get to see the lost scratching their heads and saying, I don't know how they managed it, but they did. and no better off for it. You look at history and you see through the last 2,000 years, really beyond that, because like I said, Solomon had a vision to work for Israel. It was happening there in Israel. And, and the Jewish nation, um, they were always trying to live these principles for their nation. And i got to admit, they weren't too concerned about seeing it go beyond their nation. Man, that's where the church comes in. That he started with Israel and he has spread it to the whole world. See, I've heard it said that it's believed there's more Christians who are in China than there are in any other nation in the world. It is. I won't say it's illegal to be a Christian there, but it's not it's popular. Yeah, thing. it's not practical because of the Buddhism. Yeah, uh, and, and the government kind of makes it the government. Yeah, yeah there, there are officially sanctioned churches, but they're few and they're far between, and they don't all they don't have it easy like we do. You know, here if you give money, you get a tax discount for your gift, and the church doesn't have to pay taxes on receiving that. It's about the only exchange of money in the United States where there's not going to be taxes at all. If you're on the system, well, yeah. the churches are not on the system, too. There are some, and we may not have it forever. Right. right. Um, but regardless of money, regardless of how easy or hard government makes it, we still have this ability to make the kingdom of God spring up in our little corner of the world. Maybe it's just your family, maybe it's just your co workers who get to see it, but they get to see it. We have this amazing thing. It goes on. And we just keep plugging away and make the world a better place. And things like medicine, modern medicine is around. There's a reason why so many of these hospitals are saying something or other Baptist, Methodist, <laughs> Presbyterian, whatever church. Not church, the hospital. Okay. It's because Christians have cared enough about people. Uh, I did an intellectual exercise yesterday with uh, an AI um, text, uh, and I basically asked it to project what human rights would be like if Christian Christianity had existed. Uh, actually, Christianity and Judaism, and it still seems to think that human rights would still be a thing, but they 
acknowledge that it would look different. But I'm like, I, I can't agree because there's, I don't know of another system that says that every single human has inherent worth and dignity because we're all made in the God. Everyone else says it's basically it's what you do, it's what you achieve, it's it's some enlightenment you've attained, it's something you have to give that makes you valuable. And I was talking about how Greek and Roman philosophy, um, and you know, had human rights kind of woven into it, and to some degree it did, but you stop and you look at it, <laughs> and um, they didn't treat non-citizens well at all. And even so, I mean, there, uh, mentioned it before, but back in, in the church times in, in in the Roman world, anyway, that it was very common for them to leave babies out in the weather if they didn't want them, boy or girl. But it was typically girls. They just leave the baby out and let it not. And Christians would swoop in and take care of that. And when a plague struck Rome, it was the Christians who were taking people and taking, caring for them. Everyone else was like, kill them, burn their house, let's get rid of this plague. That doesn't sound like human rights to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's some, some things you can see in Eastern philosophies that have some good things, but it, it's, as far as I can see, it doesn't seem to make it very well because in, into governing philosophies because China, Vietnam, North Korea, places that don't have a strong Western influence. Africa too. Africa? Yeah. We don't see a ton of human rights. We don't see them respected the way they are. And uh, it's one of the things that is unique, honestly, about America, as far as I know of, not that I've done research, so you know, don't hold me to this, but as far as I know of, the U.S. is the only place that our, our founding documents basically say that our rights don't come from the government, that they are given to us by our creator. And it, it's therefore the government's job not to interfere with those. No, it, it is government's job to make laws that respect those rights instead of interfering with them or tossing them out the window. So have a very unique perspective and a very unique opportunity in this chunk of land we call the U.S. <coughs> but as great as that is, it's still in place because of the church. It's in place because of things like what we've read in Psalm 72 and said, that's what we want here to be like. All right, let's move on to the next scripture. Let's see. It's in, uh, And bring it up. Thank you, Galatians. I had Second Thessalonians in mind. That's another area I have about AI. I'm not going to get into though. But anyway, Galatians chapter six gives us this idea that uh, we don't need to give up. But Galatians chapter six, verses nine and ten says, "So let not get tired of doing what is good." At just the right time, we will keep, reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should be good in <laughs> everyone, especially to those who are in favor of faith. And there's lots of places in the Bible that give us this basic encouragement to say, hey, I know you're tired. I know you're sick of it. And I get it. But we can't give up. We have a God who is a God of eternal hope, not a God who's hope of for if our guy gets elected or if our girl gets elected or if this happens or only for this long. God of eternal hope, endless hope. And so we have this opportunity to reach out into people's lives and sow that hope into their lives. So you're probably going to hear from somebody, you know, the day after the election about how the wrong person you are. And, and 
the instinct for most of the other side of the political aisle is going to be rubbed in their face. And the church has an opportunity to be something different and speak about the hope that comes beyond candidates. But again, candidates can't really, not through their office anyway, hope to encourage people with. And for being honest, presidents just don't talk like that. You know, they don't talk about the hope of Jesus Christ as being the main hope of the nation. They don't say things like that anymore. And so it comes to us. We're the ones who have to pass that message on. We're the ones who have to plant these seeds of hope in people's lives that let them know that, hey, who wins the election matters, but it doesn't matter as much as what we feel like it does. And there's gonna be another election four years from now, another one four years after that. We're gonna keep plugging away. We're gonna, the church will keep striving to make this world a better place every single day. Not just every four years, not just when our candidates in office. Matter of fact, if anything, we need to try all that much harder if our candidate that we want and doesn't in the office. Yeah, we do. We absolutely need to pray for them. And that's a big part of what we need to do. Because Jesus, like I said, in, in that Sermon on the Mount, he was talking about, hey, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's in the middle of a prayer. That's our most powerful thing. It's <clears throat> kind of so much more than we we give credit for. One thing that was kind of taught to me is that um, in terms of starting out the church, he said, you know, or somebody told me that you will overestimate what you can do in the short term. And you will underestimate what God will do in the long term. And I found that to be true. I get a little ambitious and I start trying to do more than I, I, I can do. And uh, it doesn't always work out the way I think it should. And so that's okay, because you know what? This is his church. And when Jesus was talking to Peter, you, know, you remember that passage where Jesus asked them, they say, who do you say that I am? I know people were saying all this stuff. Who do you say that I am? And so Peter spoke up and he said, you know, you're the Christ, son of God. And, uh, and Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. You can argue about whether that was, he was talking to Peter about the work that Peter would do. You can argue about whether it was the confession. You can argue about that, but you know what? You can't argue about is that after question of who or what he's talking about it's an undeniable statement that he said i will build my church jesus said i will build my church it's not peter it, it's not a set of words it's not anything it's it's god he's at work he's at work in you he's at work in me he's at work all around us we just have to pay attention we get to see it. We just got to step into those situations and just say, okay, God, what does he want me to say? What does he want me to do? And it's that small voice we were talking about earlier that we need to, to listen to. And yes, the more you listen to it, the more you draw from your inner spirit. God will say, hey, why don't you pick up a gallon of milk and take it in this home on the way home? something crazy like that I mean, you don't even know whose house you're going to. or maybe it's you're in lying in the morning to get yourself that cup of coffee and you pay for the person to drive on eventually it becomes a habit a lot of saying the nature of the nurture becomes natural and i, I say <coughs> that because in the beginning it was you know i always second guess it and sometimes i'm not gonna lie i still do second guess okay. things and i'm really trying to pray be easy to hear here but eventually it just becomes an action like you were saying um, you'll be at the store and then you'll walk out and be like, oh, well, why did I grab this gallon of milk? And then boom, it's like, hey, can you pick up a gallon of milk for me? Or, or mm -hmm. you remind me of someone, hey, I don't have a gallon of milk. Like, oh, here, I have this. Yeah, yeah. I see all kinds of stuff. I say, I don't know why the heck I was supposed to bring, you know, whatever it is with me, but mm -hmm. it just felt like I was. And then, hey, it comes in handy. 
amazing how that works out. Uh, and we can just point that out and when you give that gallon of milk or whatever it is to somebody and say, hey, you know, I have this little voice telling me I should grab that. Great. Then they can say, oh, that's weird. Um, and hopefully they're going to connect the weird with, well, that sounds weird. That sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> but by the world standards, God works in weird ways. And that's, that's why uh, why Chris Randall uses that catchphrase, crazy God stories, because by all normal standards, some of it's absolutely insane. God works in ways that is not limited by rules or custom or, or what we think things should work like. So it's amazing. I love it. All right, what's that? Got one more scripture, Elijah. Can I say something? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Okay. On that, on that scripture, you you talked about the uh, Jesus saying the rock, uh, his rock, I will build my church. Mm -hmm. What I got from that, what he was saying, is that it also was like a, like a, 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 a faith, a prophecy of faith to believe a discernment of who Jesus was. And it's insisting you know, you're listening. You know, saying that upon this rock, which was the faith that or the discernment that Peter had that Jesus was the Christ, because it came from God, it didn't come from him. Right. Peter was notoriously foolish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I am. Not alone. <laughs> Not alone, that's right. But that's that's right. Yeah. All right, where's that last scripture? Got my notes, so I'm well, I have two of them. So you two more. Pick your poison: Proverbs or Ephesians. This is okay. I'll take the Proverbs one. Never mind. Yes. Okay. Proverbs. Two, three, two, six. Mm -hmm. Just cry out for insight, ask for understanding, search for them as you would for silver, seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear of the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. The Lord grants wisdom from his mouth, from knowledge and understanding. If we're going to have a, an internal perspective on things, if we're going to understand things from the way that God sees them, we need to know what he knows. We need to at least think the way he thinks yeah, in some capacity or another. And that's what I really love about it. it that we talk about the, the awesome gift that Solomon was given there. That, that gift is waiting there for you and me. We're told in James, if you want wisdom, just ask for it. It's that simple. It's not always a pleasant experience acquiring that wisdom. It's kind of like, you know, you know, some people, I mean, that's probably, most of you guys have been around church long enough to know that there's common thought. You don't pray for patience. You don't <laughs> pray for faith, right? Yeah. That's true. Just make you wait in the back of the line five hours. <laughs> you <will. laughs> And while I get it, I understand the sentiment there. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to pray for wisdom, patience, or or faith. I need more. Yes, sir. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's it's not usually my experience building up any of those things, but it, it's there for the taking. And he's given us so much in here. You don't want to learn wisdom the hard way. Here's the easy way. Okay. Break it open as often as you can. The more you know, better off you are. And, and if we're going to understand the mind of God and how to bring the kingdom here on earth, we've got to do things his way. We've got to think things his way. And it comes back down to having to ask. You've got to have his perspective. Because otherwise, guess what? We're going to have different goals. You know what that means? It means you're fighting against God instead of fighting for him. Need to be on his side. Matter of fact, Abraham Lincoln had this uh, 
Um, I heard the story basically that um, one of his advisors was telling him, let's pray that God is on our side. In the middle of civil war, right? And his advisor tells him, let's pray that God is on our side. And Lincoln he turned it around and said, no, no, let's pray that we're on his side. Mm -hmm. And otherwise we lose. Even when we lose, even when we win, if we're not on his side, ultimately we lose. Because we put back to the back of this thing, the book of Revelation, and uh, he wins. He wins. So if you're not on his side, you lose. Be on his side. Let's get his perspective. Let's know what he wants. And let's strive for it. It doesn't. It's it's more so much more than just a matter of knowing the candidate and help the work. So all right, Mike, you got one more. I'm just in the New Testament. So where is he? Ephesians. Go ahead. Ephesians chapter four, verse one through six. <laughs> Therefore, I prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your call. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glory spoke for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father, who is over all and in all and living through all. I love this passage. It's so good, but it just it tells us the very basics of how to have the mm -hmm. kingdom here on earth. Be patient with one another. Let's love one another. Let's serve one another. Because in the end, there is only one God, and we're all going to have to bow before him and admit that he is Lord of all. And we want to show people this kingdom of God so that they can catch a glimpse in the window. It's, just, it's kind of like a kid peeping in the neighbor's window. Maybe he's watching TV. Maybe he's ruling over what's for dinner. I don't know, but that's the idea. We want them to see and to understand what it is that uh, that we have. And so it doesn't get better than life with God. We want to give them as many glimpses into that as, as we can so that they want a piece of it. And it just, again, it comes back to when I talked to uh, you guys, whether it was last week or week before, there's a book out by a historian named Tom Holland no, not the movie star, an actual historian. Uh, but Tom Holland wrote a book, I think it's called it. And um, even though Tom Holland is an atheist, the book basically comes down and says that Christianity has done history a huge favor. At least that's what I understand about the book. And, and Christianity has been a blessing to history because it's the church following him. It's the church bringing the kingdom of God into the workplace. It's bringing the kingdom of God into our families. And it's the kingdom of God here today in this room that we're gathered. And then we take it out and we spread it everywhere. And that's what it comes down to. And we've got to keep at that. Because he's given us this charge. People are going to be reason that so many people are talking about why this is such a vital election. They keep talking about issues like the economy. That's when you hear about the most. And uh, that's universally the most cared about issues by both sides of the aisle. But you know what the economy basically amounts to? Are all our concerns, all our worries about it? It comes down to hope. Stop me think about it. It's, 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 do I have a right to think that next month I'm going to be able to pay my bills? Or I'm going to be able to thrive and prosper, maybe get out of debt, or maybe actually get 
a map, some amount of wealth built out. And depending on the person, we have different goals, obviously, but the economy affects all of us. And it's all about hope. I'll tell you again, our hope is not in somebody running for president. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in knowing that he is Jehovah Jireh, that he is God who provides. Trust him. And there's going to be people who are going to be <laughs> sadly disappointed and just in utter anguish over the election. And they need hope. And we have the hope they need. We just need to reach out and show it to them and explain it to them. He's good. All the time. All the time. All the time. He's good. Let's pray. Father, I come to you and I just thank you for who you are, for what you have done and for what you have yet to do. Thank you that you are a God of hope. And that elections matter, yes, but you are of infinite importance. While presidents have influence, you are in control. You steer the hearts of kings and presidents as you want to. God, we're, we're here as your church, and we just ask that you would show us the next thing we need to do as a church and as individuals. Whatever it is, Father, we need to know the next step, and we need to have the courage to step it out and do it because it usually is scary and it's hard. Maybe it involves some kind of self-restraint. Maybe it requires giving up some of our own hopes for the future or something we wanted to buy or I don't know. Whatever it is, God. Like we were <laughs> seeing earlier. You are better. And there's nothing better than you. Help us to live like that. Help us to show the world that living like that is the best way. Because of you. Because of the one our hope is in. Don't let us forget. Don't let us despair. Christians have no place despairing when we have such a wonderful Savior. To save us again. We've made a mess of things. We probably will keep on making a mess of things. We need you to save us. Help us trust you and spread the hope. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.